Good morning. I'm Dr. Charles Bush Joseph, the immediate past president of the American Orthopedic Society for Sports Medicine, and I'm your moderator for today's webcast. The fall forecast, settling the youth sports safety score, from gender differences to sports specialization, and what parents, coaches, and athletes need to know. With preseason practices underway and back to school sports just around the corner, we know you'll agree this is a perfect time to shed light on important recommendations to keep our young athletes safe. The American Academy of Orthopedic Surgery and the AOSSM have teamed up on today's program to bring you the insight of an esteemed panel of experts who will unveil new study findings and reinforce important recommendations for our joint One Sports Injury Youth Sports Specialization Public Service Campaign. Orthopedic surgeons and sports medicine experts know that overuse injuries can have an effect on a child's game, health, and quality of life. As more athletes under the age of 12 focus on just one sport in year-round training, coaches, parents, and athletes should consider varied sports participation to prevent injuries. We also know that playing sports has many health benefits, including the development of strong bones and muscles. But children who specialize are often more likely to develop overuse injuries because of repetitive motion, many feel stressed, and even consider quitting. As a professor of orthopedic surgery at Rush University Medical Center, having long been involved in the care of high school, collegiate, professional, and recreational athletes, I know firsthand how critical the recommendations addressed today will help keep our young athletes safe. As a team physician for the Chicago White Sox and the Chicago Bulls, the messages that resonate today also have a trickle-down effect from professional to youth sports. We hope you will leave this webcast with valuable information for your readers, viewers, and listeners that will help reduce the onset of injuries that could have consequences throughout life. As we get started here, here are a few key facts to keep in mind. Statistics show that an estimated 27 million U.S. youths between the age of 6 and 18 participate in team sports and over 60 million participate in some form of organized athletics. A case-controlled study of 1,206 7 to age 18-year-olds 18, 18 demonstrate that over the course of three years, picking a main sport to focus on was an independent risk factor for injury even after adjusting age, hours per week, and sports total activity. We have today with us lead authors of Sex-Based Differences on Children on Common Youth Sports Injuries, published in the July issue of the Journal of American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. We'll hear from Dr. Elizabeth Matskin, Chief of Women's Sports Medicine and Director of Sports Medicine Fellowship at Brigham and Women's Health Hospital and Assistant Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at Harvard Medical School. She is also a member, a member at large for the Academy's Board of Directors and the Public Relations Chair for the AOSSM and will have a dual role of addressing this study and also shedding light on the public service campaign that we're going to talk about today. Next is Dr. Cordelia Carter, will address additional context of this study. She was most recently on the faculty at Yale School of Medicine and will soon become the director of the NYU Langone Health Women's Sports Center and the program director for pediatric sports medicine at Hassenfeld Children's Hospital this coming August. Finally, we'll hear from our Dr. Nehru Jathani, who's the lead author of Socioeconomic Factors for Sports Specialization and Injury in Young Athletes, now in the July issue of Sports Health, a Multidisciplinary Approach. Dr. Jasani is an Associate Professor of Orthopedics and Family Medicine at Emory Sports Medicine Research and Education. He's also lead in Emory's Tennis Sports Medicine Program and brings a wealth of experience as to our speakers in working with young athletes. Today's forum is meant to be interactive and we welcome your questions to help ensure that our topics are all covered and that we've addressed your most pressing areas of interest and that you will champion this information forward to your audiences. To submit a question, click on the arrow found in the upper right corner of your screen. Please type in your question into the question box and we'll address each question at the end of the formal panel discussion. Dr. Maskin, we'll start with you and I look forward to your comments. Thank you. So to begin, we're gonna start talking about sex-based differences in common sports injuries. So the real questions are, what do we know about sex-based differences in sports medicine 
And how does sex and gender mediate a young athlete's risk for injury and his or her outcome if an injury does occur? This article we recently published in the, the Academy Journal Art uh, Journal was looking at five different common sports injuries and looking at sex-based differences that we can find from our research that has been put in the literature already. So the first injury we're going to talk about is stress fracture. A stress fracture is when the bone sees more activity than it's ready for and we end up with what we call a bone stress injury. Now stress fractures in and of themselves are quite easy for us to treat, but the real concern is why are these occurring? And they're really occurring for two reasons. One, it's an overuse injury, and two, there's potentially some underlying pro uh, problem with the bone. So if we look back in history very quickly, in 1972, Title IX was passed. And this is what really opened the door for our female athletes. About 20 years after Title IX, a group of physicians started noticing a triad of symptoms in our female athletes. And these consisted of uh, some type of eating disorder or an energy imbalance, and what we now tend to call energy availability, or, or the nutritional status of our athletes making sure they have enough energy for the activity they're going to perform. The second part of the triad was that this lack of energy availability resulted in menstrual dysfunction. This impacted the bone, and this results in low bone mineral density, which then increases the risk of stress fracture. When we look at the literature, and we look at female high school athletes, the amount of athletes that are suffering from some aspect of the female athlete triad is quite high. 36% of our high school females have low energy availability, 54% some type of menstrual dysfunction, and 45%, especially of our endurance athletes, demonstrate bone impairment. The incidence in active adolescent females for stress fracture is over 10%. And what's concerning is these injuries are preventable. Can we advance to the next slide? So why is this important? It's important that we're aware of what this is. And if we're aware of what these, this is, we can actually prevent it from happening. And if we're aware, we can ask the right questions to screen for it. So we need to ask our young athletes about their eating, their nutritional status. We need to ask our young female athletes about their menstrual status if they're of the age. And we need to educate. We need to educate parents. We need to educate our athletes. We need to educate athletic trainers and coaches and everyone involved in managing athletes' care. This is really important because what we do know is 90% of our bone mineral density is accrued by adolescents. So our young athletes are building their bone bank for the rest of their life. And once they reach the age of 20 or so, that bone bank is as, as built as it can be. So a normal female gains approximately 2% of bone mass per year. An amenorrheic female loses 2% of bone mass per year. So if we're not picking up on these injuries early on in their life, and they're not building their bone banks, they're going to struggle with osteoporosis and fragility fractures later in life. Thank you. So we'll move to the second topic, and that is ACL, anterior cruciate ligament injuries. The first thing we'll talk about is the epidemiology. So simply put, females have a higher rate of ACL tear than males do. In fact, our most recent studies estimate this to be a two-fold risk for our female athletes. So again, the relative risk is higher in females by a factor of two to one. Although I don't want us to forget our male athletes because actually the absolute number of ACL injuries remains higher in males who have more exposure. Um, but when we talk about the epidemic of ACL injuries, it's oftentimes the female athlete to whom we are referring. When we look specifically at the risk factors for ACL, we often talk about the biomechanical or the, or the neuromuscular risk factors. Uh, and this sounds confusing, but actually this picture, I think, illustrates it nicely. So for example, we talk about landing patterns quite a bit. So that's if you're going up for a rebound, for example, and you're landing, how do, how do we land? And males and females, in fact, land differently. So for example, a female is more likely to come down into a landing uh, with a decreased knee flexion angle, so the knee is less bent. In fact, oftentimes the hip is less bent as well. The hip may also be internally rotated. And then we talk a lot about this dynamic valgus landing posture. And that's simply a fancy way of saying knock need. And so again, this picture illustrates this nicely. And so females are much more likely than males to come down into a landing in this pattern. And that puts them at risk for ACL injury. 
This is important actually because these things are modifiable. So in fact, we have very good data to show that ACL injury prevention programs that focus on modifying these factors and changing landing patterns are actually quite successful um, in preventing ACL injury, actually not just in females, but in male athletes as well. And finally, and, and to me this is uh, the biggest thing, when we look at outcomes following ACL reconstruction, and that's the surgery that we do once an ACL injury has occurred, um, we look, and when we look at the differences between males and females, we see that females, when we ask them to report their own functional outcomes, so how they feel about their knee and how they feel about their surgery, the uh, females have significantly lower scores than males do. When we look at who re uh, returns to sport, we see that females are significantly less likely, in fact, to go back to their desired sport. And finally, when we look at who needs more surgery following an initial ACL reconstruction, females are significantly more likely than males to need that surgery. So how does this knowledge help us treat our female athletes? Well, first, I think this tells us that prevention programs are very important because they are effective. Uh, I think when we look at uh, female athletes especially, we want to ensure that when they go back to sport following an ACL reconstruction that they're not just physically ready but also psychologically ready. So the fear of re-injury I think oftentimes prevents uh, female athletes from going back to sport and this is something that we could potentially address. As surgeons, we can think about changing our technique and as physical therapists and others who care for uh, athletes following surgery, maybe we need to change uh, not just the duration but the type of rehab that we do. Moving on to our third topic, this is femoroacetabular impingement or hip impingement, which is a mouthful. Uh, to simplify even what this diagnosis is, basically if you can envision the hip joint, the hip is a, it's a, typically a perfect sphere underneath a perfect cup. Uh, in people who have hip impingement, in fact, they grow a little bit of extra bone on the side. This is called a cam lesion. This MRI is, uh, is exemplifying that. That's what the black arrow is pointing to is the cam lesion. You can imagine that if the, uh, if as the hip moves, if there's that extra bone, it's going to abut abnormally the bone. Uh, and the soft tissues that live between those bones can be squished, pinched, uh, or torn. And this can cause pain. And so really, femoroacetabular impingement is a syndrome in which there's pain in the hip as a result of this abnormal bony uh, conformation. When we look specifically at sex-based differences, we see that males are in fact much more likely to have this cam deformity or that extra bone on the side, uh, on the side of the femur. One of the ways in which we make this diagnosis using x-rays, MRI, or CT is by measuring the alpha angle. And the point of this uh, slide is simply uh, to demonstrate that, in fact, females who come in uh, with pain in the hip due to hip impingement are much more likely to have a lower alpha angle than males, uh, and significantly so. And so putting this all together, uh, because uh, we don't really understand this entirely, but we're just starting to, putting this all together, when we look at sexual dimorphism, so how males and females are different, one of the main ones is that males have uh, increased muscle mass compared to females. Because females have less muscle mass, they have less dynamic stability of the hip. Females are more likely to be ligamentously lax, and so this means they have less static stability in the hip. And so all of this increased motion in females, you might imagine, will uh, result in this abnormal bony abutment as the hip moves. And so then it makes sense that females might come in having pain in the hip with a lower, uh, a lower alpha angle, which tells us that there's a smaller lesion. So at this point, how does this help us treat our female athletes who come in with hip pain? I think one thing is just to recognize that a large alpha angle is not a prerequisite for making this diagnosis. And again, we can think about how to modify our surgical techniques so that even somebody um, with a small alpha angle can get the right treatment uh, to improve the pain. So the fourth injury we're going to talk about is concussion. And concussion has uh, shown a very large increase in presentation to our offices over the last several years. The literature does demonstrate that there is a higher concussion rate in our female athletes. Even when we look at the same sports, females tend to have a higher concussion rate. Some of this may be secondary to self-reporting, and there have been studies that have shown that girls are more likely to report a head injury, and whereas boys may want to tough it out, not report it, and also fear if they report it that they're going to be pulled out of a game or miss the next game. So some of the rates may be secondary to self-reporting. Some of it may just be that females have a higher risk of concussion. Uh, so we have a lot more research we need to do. When we think about the risk factors, we can talk about anatomic and biomechanical differences. 
So females tend to have a decreased head and neck segment mass. And really what we mean, females tend to have a more slender neck and probably less muscle mass. And this probably equates to less protection against a head impact. Other things that have been looked at is estrogen, or hormonal impact on risk factors. And estrogen has been shown to have some effects on the brain after trauma, which may change the symptoms or prolong the symptoms of a concussion in a female athlete versus a male athlete. And lastly is experience. We wonder if females are not trained to anticipate body contact or head impact the same way that our male athletes are. So when we look at symptoms, Females tend to report more symptoms and different symptoms than their male counterparts. Uh, females tend to complain of headache, drowsiness, nausea, vomiting after a concussion, whereas our males tend to complain of more amnesia and disorientation. So understanding that symptom complaints can be different even for the same injury is going to be very important. So how does this help us treat our female athlete again? Well, we need to have a high index of suspicion in both our male and female athletes. They're going to underreport, and remember that females may report different symptoms, and they may have prolonged symptoms compared to our males. And this is important for us as physicians to understand when we need to take someone out of the game, and also when we can make the decision to return them back to the game. Uh, and finally, the fifth uh, common sports injury that we reviewed was, uh, was traumatic shoulder instability. So when we look at this, uh, the main thing to take away is that the incidence of primary traumatic anterior shoulder instability is significantly higher in males. In fact, in 2010, we learned that males are more than two and a half times more likely than females to present to the emergency room with a traumatic shoulder dislocation. Not only is the initial or primary traumatic shoulder instability event more likely to take place in males, but furthermore, males have a significantly higher incidence of recurrent shoulder instability as well. In fact, the two main predictors of having a shoulder uh, dislocate a second time or a third time uh, is, uh, are age as well as the male sex. Uh, you may not be able to see this table. Here's what it is showing you. Uh, if you look all the way to the right, then that yellow circle, a female who is 16 years old has about a 50-50 shot of re-dislocating her shoulder after a primary traumatic shoulder instability event. Um, a same-aged male peer, by contrast, has an 85% chance of re-dislocating. It's not until males are 27 years old that that rate goes down to 50-50, the same as a 17-year-old female. Now, uh, when we look at treatment and outcomes, uh, really there's a paucity of sex-specific data for shoulder instability. And so to me, this is an area that we can highlight and say uh, we need to work on this. So going forward, scientists and researchers and orthopedic surgeons must start to think about incorporating an athlete's sex into both our data analysis as we uh, generate research studies, but also into our, uh, making our hypotheses even a priori at the beginning of a study. So in conclusion, we've reviewed five common sex-based differences in sports. Uh, and why is this even important? And the answer is that sexual dimorphism is common in sports medicine. We see differences between male and female athletes all the time. Recognizing and being aware of this is key in order for us to be able to effectively prevent injuries in all of our athletes, as well as to customize management so that we, so that we may achieve better outcomes. Ultimately, a young athlete's sex affects his or her outcome, and so uh, understanding differences amongst patients can help us improve care for all of them. Thank you. Elizabeth, that's very good. We're, next, we're going to go to uh, Nehru Jathani. And Nehru, I think there's obviously they presented some interesting concepts. Now we're going to look a little bit almost where, where, how do the economics manage this? And certainly there's obviously a lot of information coming. Nehru? Excellent. Um, well, thank you so much. We're excited about this uh, work and this data on uh, socioeconomic influences and in injury, particularly with sports specialization. This was recently published in the Journal of Sports Health, uh, and it was actually based in the Chicagoland area um, from about 12, nearly 1,200 athletes. Um, I have a number of youth sports affiliations to try to help change the culture in youth sports right now to make it more inclusive, um, and I have no financial disclosures with that. Um, youth sports has evolved where younger and younger kids are choosing a single sport over and over again. And we're not sure whether this is a positive or a negative effect in certain areas, but hopefully this study will help uh, highlight some of the patterns. Um, but why is everyone so interested? We started, uh, this, the red dots on the screen represent any place I've spoken on this topic, at first around the country and then around the world. And, and this has really not just become a local, but not just a national, but an international issue.
at the Olympic level. Uh, AOSSM um, has taken a large lead role on this as well, too. And so hopefully um, we can start making some change with some um, messaging with campaigns. As a result, media has gotten interested, and we've had no less than 100 media requests and, and articles written on this, but some of it's related to good evidence and some of it's not. And so sometimes we're just not sure if this is fake news or real news. And we hopefully can s sort some of this stuff out with some good data. So what is our messaging? Well, it's a complex issue, and we try to help uh, people understand complex issues with simple messaging. And in the past, these types of uh, messaging with drugs and smoking during pregnancy have been pretty effective. And maybe we're hopeful with this AOSSM campaign on a one sport injury might be successful in that same context. So let's see what kind of reasons we, we have come to this and why, why is it this important. Aspen Institute Project Play has highlighted some of the uh, differences as far as participation in sport. And while there's an overutilization of sport activity, there's still a decline in overall sports participation in a number of sports and national governing bodies are really interested in this. Physical uh, activity has actually decreased uh, um, a bit as well, too, to less than 25% of young athletes are really exercising regularly, whether it's sport or not. And so these are the public health implications. But who is it that really ends up um, not exercising or not, uh, not being as physically active? Well, if you are of the lowest socioeconomic status, you are uh, much less likely to be physically active. So having more money makes you a almost three times more likely to be active. Um, so our focus of this article uh, was really to look at these factors that are socioeconomic and as they influence uh, young athletes' training patterns. Um, this whole issue of sports specialization started almost incidentally uh, about 10 years ago when we studied young tennis players, about over 500 junior tennis players in the Midwest. And we found at that time that there were high specialization rates, exceedingly high, where the majority of them only played tennis but what may have been more concerning was, and we think this is the first time this was reported, about 1.5 times more likely to be injured if you specialize. But that was only a tennis population, and we really didn't have any clinical data. So we followed this up with a long-term um, uh, article looking at nearly 1,200 uh, uh, athletes in, in a clinical setting, and this was published in the American Journal of Sports Medicine a few years back. And we tried to compare those that were getting sports physicals with those that had injury related to sports. And a couple of the key findings suggest, first of all, that we believe this is the first time to at least report this clear independent association of risk with specializing in a single sport, regardless of how many hours a week you play or uh, your age. But this is really with overuse injuries, and more specifically with serious overuse injuries where you're out for a month or longer. A couple of other training rules and guidelines that can be helpful for any coach, parent, or medical provider are when your child exceeds the number of hours per week uh, versus their age. For example, if they're 12 years old and they train 14 or more hours a week, they were more likely to get overuse and serious overuse injuries. If they played twice as many hours per week of their organized sport versus just free play for fun, that would be a training ratio of greater than 2 to 1. They're also more likely to get serious overuse injuries. And this year-round exposure of, of participating more than eight months a year was also another independent risk. And so, um, this was redefined. We, we defined highly specialized athletes with three criteria, but uh, AOSSM uh, had a consensus statement we uh, published uh, just really about one or two years ago, now looking at the age, and we had to define something. So we, we call this early sports specialization, and, and while there's still some data that needs to be um, developed, we used 12 years old as a rough guide of, of trying to get kids to at least get to 12 years old, or hopefully through a little bit of their adolescent period before they specialize in a single sport. So now, let's look at specialization and, 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 the, and also the sport type and socioeconomic influence. It's getting pretty clear that there are certain sports that basically rule out those of lower socioeconomic status uh, immediately, and sports like lacrosse and swimming and, and even soccer these days uh, tend to be um, uh, more dominated by those that make over $100,000 um, a year as far as median income. So that brings us to this particular study. Why is this important and what, how, how, what kind of effects does socioeconomic influence have on your specialization and injury risk? And so we wanted to see whether SES or socioeconomic status was uh, associated with rates of specialization and injury in young athletes and whether health insurance, whether it's public or private, would influence this as well. And finally, even if race would play a role. 
And we evaluated nearly 1,200 athletes through two academic health systems in the Chicagoland area. And we used U.S. Cens Census Health Bureau data looking at zip codes and then the medium household income that was uh, determined from that. And so basically, we <coughs> categorize uh, our young athletes as either public or private insurance, with about 20% coming from public insurance, where, in fact, your median uh, uh, income had to be less than $31,000 a year for a family of four, so very low-income families, uh, which was about 20% of our sample. Then we also looked at their medium household income and stratified it as low, medium, or high, high being roughly over $100,000 uh, a year of, of uh, income. And when we look at uh, most of our findings, we find some simple initial findings where, you know, the kids from, uh, um, you know, public uh, insurance tended to start uh, competitive sports a little bit later. And they also had training patterns which seemed to indicate that they were having more physical activity and more free play. And this resulted in what we call higher sports training uh, ratio. And we'll look at this a little bit more closely. When we look at uh, insurance type and socioeconomic status, we find that actually lower socioeconomic status kids actually have more physical activity, about 20 hours a week on average, versus those of higher socioeconomic status. And where does that difference come from? It comes from free play, from not having other coaches or parents tell you where to, where to play and how to play it. So how does that influence your injury risk? Well, first of all, you'll see that the highest socioeconomic status had by far the highest rates of sports specialization, while the lowest socioeconomic status had the lowest rates of sports specialization. Well, in turn, the highest rates of serious overuse injury seem to happen significantly higher in those with, again, more money, socioeconomic status. So we like to call this our Mo Money, Mo Problems study. Seems like we're headed in that direction. But now let's look at these training patterns again. We talk about year-round training, and this is really a, a very strong trend. We use eight months. Greater than eight months signifies year-round training. And if you look at those in lower socioeconomic status or on public assistance, they're generally underneath the eight months a year. Those, again, that have more money are more likely to train at means of eight to nine or almost 10 months a year of, of um, competitive organized training. And similarly, when we look at uh, our sports uh, um, uh, free play training ratios, we'll see we use two as our cutoff, two to one, where that is where your injury risk increases. And again, those that are of lower socioeconomic status stay under two, and those with higher socioeconomic status trend higher and higher over two. And so those differences, again, come from our free play. Um, we did see some, um, some race differences, not necessarily with the age of specialization, but again with the age of competitive sports. And this also is consistent with our socioeconomic status. Now white um, young athletes in our population, again, clearly had more, uh, had more private insurance athletes and then also had higher socioeconomic status. And this is pretty consistent with general public health data. So, uh, while these are great findings, we have to accept that this is a Chicagoland study and different um, socio socioeconomic influences influence different areas throughout the country. Um, our kids and, and families reported their own exposure hours. While we feel they're pretty reasonable, um, there is a limitation with using that. And finally, this is a clinical study. We know that these are kids who are already in clinic, and the issue may not just be the kids who are in clinic who already have access, but those that don't have access to care. And so this is a missing population that, that uh, we have to really pay attention to. So when we finally, when we look at, um, if we can advance this slide, there we go. We feel like this is the first study to report in young Chicago and athletes that as socioeconomic status increases, the likelihood of sports specialization increases and uh, more likely to do individual sports, but also to have more serious overuse injuries. However, it's interesting those of lower socioeconomic status, those kids had more physical activity and as a result more free play. And so perhaps free play is actually protective of overuse injury and may play a vital role in a young athlete's uh, life. And lastly, kids from lower socioeconomic status need more access to sport because it seems like when they do it, when they're involved in sport, they actually do it correctly and they have safer patterns of training. It's just that we're not providing them enough opportunities to do it. And the last thing I always say is, sports are meant to be fun. And so if we can do more things to encourage kids to have fun in sport, uh, I think we'll have more success in getting all kids to be physically active and also involved in sport. Thank you so much. Andrew, that was excellent. <laughs>
you know, and I, I want to congratulate all three of the speakers. I, I think clearly we have identified a couple of issues. And, and Cordelia, before we get with the formal questions, I, I want to ask you one. Uh, as we enter into the fall season where we are now, we're in that, that male-female. The males are playing tackle football. Shoulder dislocations are going to happen. And in Illinois, certainly, we have the female uh, cross-country season where the, where the girls, a no-cut sport, which is great, but we have lots of young women running and, and running beyond with their capabilities. What are the practical applications or practical lessons we're going to give parents or, or those who oversee the care of these young athletes? Sure. Uh, I'm going to take the second part of that question, which is actually one of the injuries I see, I think, um, perhaps most commonly is the mid to late season cross country runner who comes in and you can weigh in on this, too, who comes in with a, a bone stress injury. Uh, and actually right now is the exact time to start thinking about how to prevent that because oftentimes I see that actually in the transition between eighth grade and um, high school uh, where all of a sudden athletes are asked to perform at a level higher than they are used to. They don't take the summer to adequately prepare and so while they may be able to sort of hang with cross country training for the first month or two, by the time it comes to the end of the season, uh, I, you start to see bone stress, you start to see pain, uh, you know, leg pain, foot pain, and bone stress injuries. And so I think um, to, in answer to your question, what can we do right now to try to prevent those injuries in our cross-country runners, both males and females, it's actually to start thinking about how to gradually ramp up, um, gradually ramp up training, the importance of uh, taking days off, actually, but also the importance of, of preparation. Well, let me, I just want to focus one quick thing on on the metabolic side, I think that Elizabeth had talked about. Elizabeth, are there specific clues that, like, if my daughter is really is having irregular menstrual or delayed, is that is that a red flag that that really warrants medical evaluation before clearance in any type of a, you know, endurance uh, activity? It certainly is a red flag, and it's something that we as physicians need to be aware of, and parents and coaches need to be aware of. I mean, the menstrual cycle is meant to happen every month, and when it's not. We need to be worried if there's something else going in the body that's making that change. And what we've learned is it's usually some type of relative energy deficiency. So it's a very easy fix. And for you know a lot of our youth athletes, I mean, they don't understand what a nutritious meal is. And a bag of Doritos and a glass of Coke isn't going to work if you're going out and practicing sports for two hours in the afternoon, especially in that kind of high school adolescent group. So it's not just you know making sure they're eating, but making sure you're eating the proper food to feel your body for the activities you need. So it is certainly we need to be aware of, and I think if we don't ask the questions, these young female athletes aren't gonna offer that information. You know, we have a question from one of our, uh, our listeners, uh, from William Carroll. What is your position on the data of, of, of use and da of, of wearables in prevention of injuries? I can tell you, on a professional level, yes. Uh, you know, when money is no object, we use them all the time, <laughs> extensively, almost ad nauseum. And, and our coaches sometimes, uh, uh, really don't like it. It sort of takes away that subjective appearance of performance. But athletes today rely on a lot. How about our younger age group? Where should we be investing that? Um, <clears throat> so this is, I guess, points to what we're talking about in the article is that while I think there's value in finding out how much and how much exposure they have at a very high level for a small group of people at elite level, it's not where the public health issue is with that. And so we're not going to help 90% of our kids with this who really just need to do self-reported monitoring and have a less organized uh, environment. So I'm actually not as big of a fan in the, in the professional population, sure, in the elite population, but in the, in the broad scheme of things, uh, uh, I don't think we should be using that. I think self-report of, of exposures and just how many hours a week, simple questions that parents can understand is enough to get, we have a lot of information on that already. And, and, and they were, I, what was your approach? You, you've got a, you know, a relatively wealthy suburban family from uh, northwestern Atlanta area. And their young son, they believe, he's 9 or 10, that he has, quote, Division I capabilities from a tennis because he's, just, he's comfortable hitting a racket. How do you guide the child and how do you guide the parents? What's those practical first encounter visits yeah. you may have? The first thing is you look at the child, not the parent, and you say, what are your goals? What do you want out of tennis? And that's, or what do you want out of your sport? And um, for many of them, actually, they are, are a little oblivious to the big picture, but they just want to actually have fun, and, and they, like, they just say, I really like playing tennis. And then uh, when you include the parents, you ask other questions that give an idea of what their um, exposures are, say, what other sports do you play? I, almost, I ask it almost assuming they should be, and then we realize that they may not be <laughs> playing any of their sports. I ask what other sports you play for fun, and then ask how many hours a week do you participate in your sport. I think those are simple questions 
that every medical provider and really every coach should be asking and, and ask questions about how off seasons are, when do you have time off and, and uh, outside of that and help guide them to, to get close to their goals and, and be realistic with it. I think that's the hardest well, part. Courtney, let me ask you this. I mean, how do you handle the, the mouthpiece parent? That you ask a child a question <laughs> and the parent continually answers over and over again. And, uh, and you, uh, you know, certainly in certain situations you would chase the parents out of the room, but you can't do that with, uh, you know, with young patients. Uh, what, what are the strategies that you use? Or what are the information you're looking for? Is it facial mannerisms of the athlete when you're detecting you know, a, a, you know, dissonance between what, what you're perceiving, what the parents are saying? Uh, I, think you've, I think you've started to answer the question a little bit. I mean, I think um, depending on the age and maturity, if you can ha have an interaction with a, uh, with a patient, just yourself, or sometimes I'll have a nurse come in with me, so it's more of a conversation, but with, um, just with the patient athlete, I think that can be very helpful because oftentimes the answers are different. Um, and then I think a lot of what we do is it's not just the first time encounter, it's building a relationship with an athlete and that athlete's family. And so, you know, maybe at your first visit, you start to notice this dissonance uh, between the answers of child and parent, but then maybe over time you can start to tease that out a little bit more. Um, so I think, uh, I think the answer is, um, as, in as much as you can, you get the answers from the patient. And really, at the end of the day, it's about relationship building and trust building so, so everybody you know, gets the outcome that they want. Elizabeth, let me ask you this. And um, obviously, we, you spoke earlier on that, that running overuse injury in that young, vulnerable population. How do, you, how do you explain to a family when a child says, I can run in pain or shouldn't I run in pain? What is that difference between soreness and pain? And what are the techniques that you use to sort of differentiate those two factors? So, we, you know, we actually spend a lot of time talking about it. And there are injuries that it's probably okay to push through some pain. There are injuries that are not. And a bone stress injury is one that is not. And I'll often talk to those athletes and I'll tell them, you know, I need you to back off now and rest now. And we'll try and kind of wean you back into sport over the next six weeks. Versus if you continue to run or push through this, this injury can turn into something worse and you'll be out of sport for six to 12 months. So we spend a lot of time kind of talking about what's okay, what's not okay. And, you know, some injuries can really turn into bad players. A stress fracture of a, of a hip can be managed very easily non-operatively if it's caught early and addressed. And if a young patient continues to play on that and it becomes a full-on fracture, it's a surgery um, that's going to affect them for the rest of their life. And I think, um, you know, I have a few slides to summarize the campaign if we want to roll to them real quick. And I think there's a few good points in there that address a little bit of that. While oh, we're waiting for those slides to get up, I, I just, the, the issue is, um, how do athletes, you know, what point, and parents do want to know, at what point do I listen to my child? What point do I have my child evaluated? And that's sort of, I think, hopefully it'll cover some of that practical guidance about what are the things uh, that we can do to self-manage. There are some clinical elements that clearly groin pain in a young athlete is, is, is a red flag. Why don't you go ahead? And so these are just a few slides. I really wanted to summarize why we thought this campaign was so important, both the AOS and the AOSSM. And, Number one, sports are beneficial for our youth, and we want them to be active, we want them to be fit. We know that kids that participate in sports are gonna have a healthier life, both physically and mentally. The risk of depression and anxiety is much less in our youth that participate in sports, and they tend to do better in school and academically. But young athletes who play just one sport year round are at risk for overuse injuries. Overuse injuries account for half of all the sports injuries we see in middle school and high school. So that really relates into the fact that half of the injuries we treat are preventable. So again, half of the injuries we treat are preventable. And I think um, this was briefly mentioned, but when we look at the number of youth athletes out there, less than 1% are gonna make it to the elite status. So our goal is that these kids can participate and participate for a long time and enjoy it. Kids have immature bones, they don't rest enough, and they, if they don't train and condition properly, they're gonna have overuse injuries. And although we can treat these injuries, they're not always without consequences later in life. And for example, when we see a 13-year-old with an ACL injury, we can reconstruct it and we can rehabilitate them and get them back out on the field and back into sports. What we can't prevent 
is the osteoarthritis they're going to have in that knee in 15 to 20 years. So this is going to be a very young adult in their late 20s or early 30s with an arthritic knee. So this is the problem. We can get them back out on the playing field, but there are consequences that are going to occur. The other problem is 70% of kids are dropping out of sports by the age of 13, and this is secondary to the pressure they're feeling of playing one sport from coaches, parents, and other adults. So these children lose the benefits of exercise, teamwork, and healthy competition later in life. So the real purpose of this campaign was to heighten awareness to the public, to the media, to our patients. We've distributed this campaign to over 400 outdoor media spaces, including billboards, shopping malls, and bus shelters around the country. And we have a fantastic website with tons of free materials for coaches, for parents, and for physicians. And that's at orthoinfo.org backslash one sport injury. So really our take home recommendations are that kids should play multiple sports and they should play multiple positions. Nutrition is key to bone health and to avoiding some of these overuse injuries that we see. Preseason wellness checkups are important and we need to really ensure adequate time for rest and recovery. And this means adequate sleep on a nightly basis as well as adequate time off from sports or time from between different sports. This is really important for these kids' immature bodies to recover. Kids need to warm up and cool down. They need to incorporate strength and stretching into their training. We've already heard from Dr. Carter that some strengthening, especially in our female athletes, can be preventative for ACL injuries. Kids need to hydrate, and they really shouldn't play when injured or in pain. This is a really good time for them to seek out one of their sports medicine local physicians. And so lastly, again, we can treat them, but what we really need is our parents and coaches to help prevent them. Thank you. I want to thank everybody, and certainly we appreciate, uh, certainly our speakers will be available. If you have questions, we'll be happy to respond to those uh, after completion of the webcast. Uh, Nehru, but if, just one last moment. I, I want to get back to the, you know, the social economics. Uh, you know, we said more money, more injury. Um, how is that? How is that <laughs> relating uh, when you have uh, when you have these discussions with families and and, uh, and focus groups that you speak to? Are parents getting it? I, I think the the other issue that I took from that is that kids who have a tendency to sports specialize, their downtime does not go to physical activity; turns into screen time. And how are you managing that element in, of education with families? <clears throat> it's, as well, I'm sure uh, all of you, you all are, um, you know, sports medicine providers know, it's much easier to talk to a family and a parent and a kid after they're injured. And that's when they start listening. It's much easier, uh, I deal with a lot of, as a non-operative provider, a lot of uh, overuse injuries, so it's much easier to talk to them after they've had multiple episodes of it. Then you have a more captive audience. The prevention side and why I like this campaign uh, so much is actually it's buy-in from parents and coaches of changing how the systematic approach is. So I can take an individual athlete and their family and counsel them and to help change that, but I also release them into an environment where we end up with the same patterns. So I think when we engage uh, the, the coaching and the parents are in powerful influence because they have the money to decide where they want to put their child. And if, if they come together and say this is too much, then they have a little more influence on, on the system itself. And I think that's what I try to focus on. And I also work with national governing bodies. You know, Elizabeth, uh, one thing that I see, unfortunately, in these overuse events, we have a tendency to lump blame on coaches. Uh, but I, I have to say, sometimes I believe that we have to put more back onto the parent because an individual coach, a, a child may be playing on three different teams or having, you know, a school team, a club team, a travel team. Uh, and so individual coaches don't realize the athletic burden or load that each child is, uh, is encountering with each individual team, but in a cumulative basis. Um, are there governing body issues that, that can help along that lines? I know we've had some issues in Illinois where we've tried to put responsibility almost too much on the high school coach, uh, but the high school coach is only controlling, say, 20 or 30 percent. Are there strategies used in other jurisdictions that you're aware of? So I think this, this is the big problem, and I think we need to think about two things. Is one, how to limit our kids um, from playing, just like you said, on multiple teams during the same season. I mean, if they're playing town soccer, club soccer, they have private soccer coach, it's just too much, and it's resulting in overuse injuries. The other problem is even the kids that want to play multiple sports, they end up overlapping because soccer starts, you know, midsummer and goes to midwinter, and then you've got the winter sports starting in midfall, 
So then there's this overlap where kids are trying to get from soccer practice to basketball. And again, it's almost too much for their young bodies. So figuring out how uh, you know, some private schools have done a very good job of having set seasons. And one season goes from, you know, this date to this date, and the next season can't start, and they don't overlap, and you can't play on multiple teams. Uh, but trying to work with, you know, your local communities, um, you know, each state has an interscholastic athletic association, and they tend to be a pretty good governing body. There aren't a lot of laws out there yet, but I think as we continue to really look into the data, the research, and try to move forward on advocacy, we can try and change some of these things. You know, I, I, would, I would encourage the, the, the parental advocacy side. I, I would hate to see government regulation come into play in terms of how we manage our individual children. Let me ask you, uh, 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 Cordelia, what, where, are the, where are the gaps in knowledge we have and what are you working on? What do you see, that, where is our research taking us over the next three to five years? What's the data that you and your group is trying to acquire? Uh, I think looking specifically at sex-based differences, this is really something that is in its infancy. And so that's exciting because then the world is our oyster. I mean, I think we really are just starting. I mean, I, th I think initially the low-hanging fruit was, you know, we see big differences just simply in terms of incidence. And so I think now that we're establishing different uh, incidence rates between males and females, for example, in ACL injury, then the next thing is once we understand that there's a difference in who gets the injury, and now we, then we start to figure out why, and so and we're learning some of that with ACL. But I think, so for example, with ACL injury, I think it's going to be very interesting if we can start to generate some hypotheses on, well, perhaps if this is a reason why this is a, a risk factor for injury, then maybe when we do our surgery, we use a different graft, and so if a different, could use, could modifying our surgical technique for a female result in a better outcome for that athlete that then is equivalent to that of a male with a different graph. So I think, I think that's where we are and so that's where we're going. How can we really tailor prevention efforts but uh, to, by, to athletes as a function of you know, whether they're male or female but also even our treatment efforts with the ultimate goal being you know, the best outcome? So I think that the, what we're looking at, I think from the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and the AOSM, that, that really treatment registries and trying to get more generalized knowledge in large bodies. I think, Nehru, you should be congratulated. You know, an inter, inter, inter institutional study like that really gives a broad base of information. What are the areas that, 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 you're, that you see moving forward in, in the memory? <coughs> we're gonna probably start a couple of different studies, which I think will be very helpful, is one, looking at a sport by sport, analysis of the effects of sports specialization and what are the appropriate ages and training volumes that are safe, but also good for performance from the coaching side. And the other one I think that should influence all of us, whether you're surgical or non-surgical, is what are the long-term quality of life effects of an injury uh, and the rate of sport participation? Because at the end of this, our message is that it's your lifetime goal isn't to just be good at 14, 16, or 18, is that our kids still participating one, two, three years after the concussion, ACL, or overuse injury, and which of those effects would still be uh, um, helpful. So if we have one message is, is really the campaign is let's not just focus on, on a short-term goal. And for parents, if we can in, in think, if you worked just as hard at trying to get your kid to be an elite level 14-year-old as you did to try to get them to participate in sports when they were an adult, I think we have a different landscape. You know, Elizabeth, one of the research strategies or, or primary research goals we have at the AOSSM is really better defining that return to sport criteria. And, you know, and, and I think we would agree there's nothing more devastating than a child or adolescent who's injured, returns to activity, and then is re-injured again. I think that often leads to devastating. Where are the gaps in knowledge we have and where do you think the areas that we can improve on? Is it rehabilitation or questioning or psychologic profiles? It's a little bit of both, and I think we're just starting to realize that rehabilitation in a lot of these young athletes is, is more than just the biology of an injury healing. That, you know, we need to, one, make sure that athlete is ready to go back to, you know, has a competitive edge. And that's usually with strengthening physical therapy. But then I know Dr. Carter briefly touched on the psychological aspects of return to sport. There's a fear of re-injury in a lot of these youth athletes and figuring out how we can overcome that. Because we also know that these athletes that go back either too early or have a fear of re-injury have a higher risk of re-injury. And so that's really important for us to prevent down the road. Cordelia, uh, in your experience, I mean, and obviously as we're both we're as parents and as co you know having colleagues, how do you how do you read the patient? I mean, what are the there's some elements that um, that early on a patient of may meet all those physical characteristics, saying, "All right, I'm safe to return." 
but you realize you, they don't. I mean, what are the soft points that you may use or, or guidance you may give parents and families on those issues? What are the questions you might ask an athlete? Uh, I think sometimes you can just ask them. You know, I think I, I have had patients, uh, you know, status post and ACL reconstruction who have passed their functional movement screen, um, and you can tell that they are very anxious about a return to play. Um, and so, and while I think it's, you know, a healthy dose of caution is important, I think it's the, the, those injuries happen in a split second. And so if you have that split second hesitation because you don't have the confidence in your ability to go back to sport and function at the level, you know, where, where you were previously, uh, then that's a problem. And so, but I also think sometimes just actually starting that discussion with, you know, how do you feel about g going back? Do you feel like you're ready? What have you done to make yourself ready? Because um, sometimes, sometimes the answer is, I've talked to my church. You know, I, so I think the answer is you start that discussion and you figure out what other sources of support besides just physical therapy uh, and, and Western medicine are, you know, can help you prepare to go back. Can I add one thing to that? Fire away. I think it's just really important to remember that as sports medicine physicians, we're really proud to get these athletes back onto the playing field, but it's not 100%. So again, these overuse injuries that are preventable, we need to prevent them because there are gonna be a certain percentage of athletes that don't go back and don't go back to the same level of competition, no matter how well we treat them or how good a surgical procedure we do. Let me ask the more difficult question, Nehru. How do you tell a parent or an athlete enough is enough? That, that quote, the, their body will not let them compete to the level they want and you need to to redirect them. I mean, uh, you know, certainly in that in the young adolescent or certainly the, the early teenager, sometimes those conversations are exceedingly difficult, but by the same token, maybe the best thing in the world for them and certainly for their longevity as I think as Elizabeth talked about earlier. How do, when do you make that decision that, that enough is enough and time to redirect? Yeah, with every injury actually, I say we're gonna have a little picture conversation. What do you do with this injury? And then we're gonna have a big picture conversation. How are we gonna keep you to have a relationship with your sport? And this isn't about having a relationship with your sport for the next three months, but a long-term relationship. And that's what influences that decision. So if, if, uh, if it's a situation where we have to uh, buy time now, and whether it's a couple of weeks or even six months or a long period of time, so that we have an opportunity to have a long-term relationship with the sport in whatever capacity we can, that's our big picture conversation. So I try to introduce that in every injury, and particularly the ones who keep coming in. And we have some data that shows actually those that um, they're frequent flyers. Those that have overuse injuries and are longer term follow up tend to be the ones who keep coming in and, and they tend to be the ones that are, are, are probably gonna be specialized as well too. Um, so I try to have a big term, uh, big picture long term conversation with everyone. I think as physicians, we all want to be liked and we, you know, you want to be the good guy and you feel like you're helping somebody by giving them what they want. And I think, you know, the, um, the more patients that I see, I think sometimes the kindest thing that you can do is to be the one willing to be the bad guy. Um, and I think, cause I think sometimes it's very difficult for parents to say, you know, you're, you can't play this right now. This is, you know, you've had this injury and this injury and this injury and the goal is just get back, get back, get back. And I think sometimes the best thing to do is just to say, listen, I'm, I'm going to be the one willing to be the bad guy here. And so, and you need to be done for this season until this, until you are symptom free. And then, and then the good news is once you, you know, once you are symptom free, then we're going to build you back in gradually and we're going to do it all right. So that, but when you do go back, you get to stay back and then, you know, you get to en enjoy and participate in the sport that you love. Uh, Elizabeth, uh, oftentimes parents and families will come and ask, what role does nutrition and supplements have in the prevention of injury and or the treatment of injury? Uh, is there, is there, do you have strong suggestions one way or the other? So, I mean, we know nutrition is important and we talked about energy availability and just having a good, well-balanced diet. When we start talking about supplements, there's not a lot of good scientific evidence to support their use. Uh, so wasting money on things that kids probably really don't need is probably not necessary. So if these kids are getting a well-balanced diet and getting the energy they need for the sports they participate in, there's no need for anything further. Nehru, uh, what, what is your position on, on uh, individual uh, performance athletes, of which tennis is to a degree, as opposed to the team athlete? Is there a different psychology involved? And in, in what are your tricks <coughs> on managing that? Definitely. Um, we had a sport-by-sport -sport analysis uh, looking at our data on uh, what type of injuries individual athletes would get, and they're more likely to get overuse injuries versus team uh, athletes would get uh, acute injuries. 
Uh, the nice thing about individual athletes is you can control your training patterns and your regimen much more easily than a team-based environment. And I you know, happen to take care of quite a few tennis players. This, unfortunately, is female uh, predominance as well, too, with individual and technical sports. That includes gymnastics and dance and all these other uh, sports in addition to this. But it does offer the advantage of having some control of your training patterns. And again, in the setting of an injury, you can actually have an opportunity to make that change versus changing a team. I would encourage, again, our listeners, if you have questions, please click that box in the right-hand corner and feel free to submit questions. We have an esteemed panel for another five minutes. Uh, Cordelia, what, what are the main messages that you want to relate today in terms of both parents and coaches? Uh, I think we've heard, I think everybody say this, but the first thing is that sports are fun. Sports should always be fun, and that's why, um, not, that's why actually everybody should do them, uh, and ideally everybody loves them. And so I think our goal is to keep the most number of kids participating in sports and as many sports as possible for as long as possible because um, really at the end of the day, the physical and mental benefits that you, that you um, gain through sport participation um, I, I think uh, um, uh, affect all aspects of life in just a really positive way. So I, 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 I can't agree with you enough. And just in, uh, I grew up in the pre-Title IX era and now living in the Title IX era for as long as I have. Uh, you know, the confidence that, that young people get, specifically young women, get, I think propels them on to a much greater life in both their, their life, their family life, their social life. Uh, and, and certainly we would never want to do anything to discourage that. Nehru, uh, I, I guess I want to get back to one last point. It, um, obviously, being a tennis servant, uh, is how much of athletic success is innate and how much of athletic success is actually training and hard work? Um, it is, you know, David Epstein wrote a nice book on this, and there's your hardware and, and your software, and, and you have to come to realization that there's a certain level of um, success that, you can, that anyone can achieve, and that's, that's your limit. Like I always say, my level of success was going to probably be not going to homecoming and getting good grades and then eventually becoming a doctor and playing tennis for fun. <laughs> and I wasn't going to be a professional tennis player while I had aspirations. And, and you have to come to that realization. So, so uh, it's very difficult to overtrain beyond what your actual limitations are. And that's the concept that's hard to deliver to, to a parent. And I think we have to, again, be honest. And, and we have to, as doctors, Remember that performance is actually an important goal for everyone. So we're not saying we don't want you to perform. There's a group of people who, who it's important to perform. And we want to help them perform, but we don't want to ignore the other group as well, too. So Elizabeth, I'll give you last comments. So I think the most important thing is we're looking for your help to really bring awareness and to provide education to everyone who's involved with our youth athletes. On behalf of uh, our esteemed panel, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, certainly, if you have questions, I will be more than happy to follow up. And uh, we're, we're more than, uh, there's a lot of work to be done in this area, but I think the information uh, that we're disseminating at this point will continue to move the needle in terms of both public perceptions as parents and organized sports and really uh, in, in, our, in the development of our youth. So thank you very much today. Uh, we're now at the end of our hour. Thanks to our dedicated group of orthopedic surgeons for their presentations and recommendations. We want to thank all the participants for your interest and questions. All the information from today's webcast, including the study manuscripts, are available on the ortho.org forward slash one sport injury website. Uh, we look forward to helping you with your stories and working with you in the weeks and months ahead. But please continue to consider the AAOS and the AOSSM uh, for, as your sports safety resource, again, at ortho. Uh, orthoinfo.org and stopsportsinjuries.org. Uh, thank you very much and have a good afternoon. We appreciate your time.